I want to thank you. My name is Julie Larry, and I'm the Director of Advocacy. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. I'm the Director of Advocacy at Greater Portland Landmarks. I've been involved with Landmarks for a long time, first as a docent, um, and then um, in the, uh, about four years ago, I was hired to come to work to Greater Portland Landmarks. Um, my background is actually in architecture, um, and so I worked mostly in historic preservation before I came to Greater Portland Landmarks. I want to thank you for all coming out and joining us this evening. Um, Last year, Greater Portland Landmarks received a Historic Preservation Fund grant from the National Park Service. Um, that was a planning and survey grant that's administered by the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. Um, our grant project was to document historic resources in areas projected to be impacted by rising sea levels. Um, the grants are mark matching grants, and so we, the work that we've completed this year would not have been possible without the generous donations that we receive from our membership and um, to support our preservation and education activities like this lecture this evening. Um, in addition to thanking our members um, and the National Park Service and the Main Historic Preservation Commission, um, we'd like to thank People's United Methodist Church for hosting us this evening so that we can um, present some of the history and images that we collected this year. I'd also like to thank all of the neighborhood residents, uh, the city of South Portland and the South Portland Historical Society who shared their stories, information, and their time with our interns this summer. Um, we've been thinking the last few years, um, educating ourselves about the possible impacts of climate change. I actually live in the biddeford Saco area and I'm pretty um, familiar with some of the damage that's been happening in the Camp Ellis neighborhood and as well as down in Biddeford Pool. Um, we wanted to see how we could help owners of historic resources better prepare for the coming challenges. And a few years ago, we published a booklet on how you can make your old house more energy efficient. This is a sample copy that I brought with me tonight. We um, sell these on our website if you're interested. There's some really low cost, easy to do things and some more um, challenging and harder to do things that you might need to hire someone, um, a cons uh, contractor to come do. But it's a really helpful little booklet. So we've been thinking about how we can help homeowners make their homes more energy efficient and how to be more resilient. And one of the things that we knew we needed was better information on properties at risk, particularly from flooding events. And we knew we wanted to focus in part on the Bayside neighborhood in Portland. That's the area on the northern side of the peninsula uh, adjacent to Back Cove. And as you can see from these images up here, um, the top image is a projected sea level rise map. And the image on the bottom is an overlay of the 1776 map of Portland over um, a 2000, I think 2014 um, satellite image of the city. And you can see that pretty much it aligns that the projected flood levels are going to take those areas that were not historically part of the peninsula. Those are areas that were filled land. Um, so those we knew was one neighborhood that we wanted to look at this summer. Uh, while we were looking at some of those projection maps, uh, we started looking at Ferry Village because we were quite surprised to see this projection, which really is bringing water pretty far into the neighborhood around Sawyer Street, almost all the way to Broadway. Um, this was a little bit of a surprise. Um, never have lived in the neighborhood, but I knew the neighborhood a little bit. My dad was in the Coast Guard and um, was down at the base a lot. And I was a little surprised to see this. Um, and so I said, hey, we knew that uh, Ferry Village is one of the city's oldest neighborhoods. And we had done some survey work um, a few years back in the Willard Beach neighborhood, and we'd been looking to do another survey in South Portland. So this seemed like an opportunity to to come back to South Portland and take a look at the Ferry Village neighborhood. So what is a survey? What is it that we do? You may have seen our interns. We had four interns this summer. Two uh, lived and worked over here in South Portland, did the field work, and then we had two other interns who were living in Portland and working in the Bayside neighborhood. They documented each building in the survey area with a photograph, several photographs usually, and recorded information about its materials. Um, they also documented features that might be impacted by weather events. So they were looking for things that might be impacted by water, 
the location of utility entrances, entries below grade, basement windows, exterior fuel storage. They were looking for things that might be impacted by wind, like mature trees or things attached to the house, like satellite dishes. Um, they were also look, looking for things um, that might mitigate heat impacts, like the presence of AC units or um, shade trees. All of that data goes into a state database that's maintained by the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. It's called the Karma Map Viewer, C-A-R-M-A, and um, each building or structure that we've documented can be viewed by, by clicking on one of these, they're like little monopoly houses. Um, you can go in and click the house and it'll bring up the survey report for that house. Um, you can see there's some areas across the river in Portland that are shaded kind of a pinky purple. Those are historic districts. Some of the houses that you can see have, um, are like orange yellow. Those are buildings that have been determined eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. So the fire station, Mahoney Middle School, or some of them in South Portland that have been determined eligible. Um, and then the um, gray houses have been determined in ineligible for listing on the National Register. And then the green are um, resources that have been recently surveyed. So you can see the Willard Beach grouping to the right of this slide and the large number of Ferry Village properties that we looked at. It was over 400 properties in Ferry Village. So in addition to doing all of the field work, we also do a lot of research. Um, we, it's important for us to understand how our neighborhood develops, so we understand the context of the buildings, why and when they were built, who may have resided there. And in our research, we use lots of sources like books. Um, some of the really wonderful ones that we use were the history of Cape Elizabeth, because South Portland was originally part of the town of Cape Elizabeth. The South Portland Historical Society is the many villages of South Portland and the history of South Portland, Maine. We also use a lot of maps and photographs. Um, this is a historic photograph of the former Knights of Pythias Lodge, which was located at High and Preble Streets in Ferry Village and was demolished in 1973. I also just love looking at the people in the photographs and their, and their outfits as well. We also go through the Registry of Deeds and look at land plans that have been filed for neighborhoods. This is a land plan that was filed at the time they were starting to do the fill at Cushing's Point for the shipyard. So you can see the red line at the top was the existing um, um, ledge out to Bug Light. And you can see the area that I highlighted in blue was water at that time. Um, the dark line is where the fill was going to go. And you can see the dashed um, blue line indicated that there had been a brook that was coming out from the School Street area crossing under Front Street um, and going out through the mud flats. You can sort of see that too coming in this aerial image. So that was kind of the first clue that's, that made me think, oh, that's why there's a topographical reason why that projected flooding is um, going on around the School Street and Sawyer Street ends of the neighborhood. So this is a, a late 1930s aerial image before they filled in Cushing's Point. You can see the breakwater going out to Bug Light. Um, in the upper left of the image, that's a sardine uh, packing plant that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And what I would really like to point out is you can see where I've inserted Preble Street um, in red on the left side. And you can see all of the housing that was demolished, um, that was part of the neighborhood that was demolished for expansion of the shipyards. Very early on, we took a look at how many um, and where the impacted properties might be from that projected sea level rise and overlaid that. This is a 1914 map, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But we, what was curious to us when we were looking at this initially was that the low area was where the, his, the most historic resources were or the oldest buildings were and that the area that developed later was not the area that was more likely to flood, which is generally the reverse in some neighborhoods. Generally, the wetland doesn't get built on that stays farmland the longest. This is a really early map of um, the 1857 Atlas of Cumberland County. I've circled the Ferry Village in red. Um, at this time, South Portland was still a part of Cape Elizabeth. And you can see the little black dots. Each little black dot is a building or a dwelling. And not a lot of dwellings and buildings in Ferry Village at that time. Um, but we do see that there's a number of 
wharves sticking out into the harbor or into the river. And of course, we know that uh, Ferry Village has a long history of shipbuilding, um, starting in the early 1800s. And so it's not surprising to see that that was predominant and um, on this very early map. Uh, another map that we look at, it was the 1871 Atlas of Cumberland County. Now at this scale, it's not very helpful for Ferry Village, but luckily we can zoom in on to this inset map of Ferry Village. And what was surprising about this to us was looking at all of that subdivision of land on the right-hand side of the slide that was planned to be filled in over Cushing's Point and to develop out towards Fort Preble, um, over towards SMCC. Um, all of those street names were named after presidents. Uh, we were surprised to see this in 1871. A lot of the subdivisions that we see in the Portland area happen um, after the time of when the, um, the trolleys come into a neighborhood, and so this was predate a trolley into the neighborhood. And what we found was this was actually um, a planned community in 1863. Uh, it was called the Days Map of East Portland, or South Portland it was sometimes referred to, and this is a redrawing of that map in, from 1918. Um, that would have been a lot of houses in the neighborhood. Um, going back and zooming in a little bit more on that 1871 map, we can get an idea of what was happening along the waterfront, and, as well as deeper into the neighborhood. You can see some of the black dots that have green around them. Those are usually schools or churches within a neighborhood. Um, but looking at the waterfront, we can see on the upper right, um, pretty much in the center of the screen, it says Pickett's Shipyard. Uh, in 1850, George Turner and James Cahoon, they bought a large portion of land in Ferry Village. Um, their intention was to subdivide that land and sell it at reasonable prices so that they could develop a working class neighborhood. Um, but they also began a shipbuilding business along the coast and their shipyard business was joined by a master builder named James Pickett. Um, in 1845, they built the Elizabeth, which would serve as the ferry that connected Ferry Village and Portland. Um, on this map, just to the left of where the Pickett's shipyard is, you can see kind of a U-shaped um, carve-out in a wharf. That's the Marine Railway um, that was owned by the Dyer family. And then to, further to the left, there's another wharf, and that was um, connected with Dyer's shipyard. Here's an early image of the Ferry Village waterfront. Um, you can see uh, the eastern waterfront in Portland in the background. We look at a lot of historic images, trying to connect them to existing buildings. Unfortunately, this was, is one that had been demolished. This was a social um, hall, the Union Hall, that was demolished in 1956. Here's a historic image of the Marine Railway that I was just mentioning on the map that was established on Front Street in the 1850s. Um, it was the Cape Elizabeth and, hold on. The Cape Elizabeth Wharf and Marine Railway, when it was owned by the Dyer family, then later became the Portland Merchants Marine Railway, and then a few years later became the Portland Shipbuilding Company, which you can see on the sign in the left. So portions of that are now uh, Aspasia Marina. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we were looking at these buildings, and you know, it's it's a little bit easier with houses to kind of figure out when they might have been built, what's original. It's a little bit harder with more utilitarian um, industrial buildings. Um, and so what was really curious about the building in the back here was these bays, which you would tend to see more in like residential buildings. And so the interns were like, that can't be real, that can't be original. And we're like, well, it could be. Then we found this bit, we found this historic image down here. Um, which the bay, so the bay on the right hand side of the building is a, is an addition, but this has a, an early image with that bay on there. So um, I told them never assume. <laughs> Um, here's another image of a towboat um, that was built here in South Portland, but then outfitted in Portland at the Portland Company, um, which would have been, you can just barely see the, the grain elevators in the background of this building, um, and so the Portland Company would have been off the slide to the right here. Um, so we also look for later images. Um, this is a 19, early 1940s image from when they were starting the fill on Cushing's Point, on the, up, the image on the upper part of the slide. You can see the, the trucks and the car out there. It looks like a, almost like a beetle or something out there. Um, and in the background, um, we're, you know, so that wasn't necessarily what we were looking at. We were looking for the buildings. So we can see the buildings in the background, which you can see on this Google Street image just below. 
Um, this is, uh, also includes one of the oldest houses in the neighborhood here, which is at 196 Front Street, which was built about 1810. This is going back and looking again at that 1914 uh, map. And one of the things that I thought was interesting on here was even though the western part of the Mussy Farm subdivision was laid out in the 1890s, excuse me, um, by 1914, there was very little development over on Margaret and Harriet Street. There's almost no little yellow houses filling in those lots. Um, so it took a while for that side, the western side of Fairy Village to develop. But what is interesting that you can see here on the map is there is, um, that, is it the Henley School on Broadway? If I get that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you can see that's the pink, pink equals brick in these maps. You can see the pink building closer to Broadway, surrounded by the green. And then just off to the left of the image, and I'll zoom in on that, um, is the former bicycle plant. Here's an aerial image looking at the, the same portion of the neighborhood a little bit later on, and you can see the complex of buildings out on the point there where River Place Apartments are now. I'm zooming in a little bit more. So there's some historic maps that tell us a little bit more about um, the bicycle plant, it was very early on, it was, uh, it was built to be a plush plant, which would have been um, uh, fabric for automotives and uh, like seats and fabric like that for cars and motor, motor cars. Um, and that, but I guess apparently there was never any plush actually manufactured there, but um, then the, Lo the Lovell Cycle and Armament com Company went into the building and um, the big image on the right hand side uh, is from 1896. It shows you there was a brick portion of the building and then the yellow is uh, the wood frame section of the building. And then on the left is the 1914, uh, zooming in on the 1914 map. Um, and it, later on, um, the Lovell Cycle plant wasn't there for a long time. It became the Marine Hardware and Equipment Company took over the building. One of the things that was interesting on the 1914 map in addition was right there by the, the bicycle factory building, there was a proposed bridge that was going to connect from the, the waterfront over to off Ocean Street, um, near where there's a, um, like a CMP power station over off Ocean Street. There was going to be a bridge that was going to connect Ferry Village over to Knightville. Here's a, this is from a, one of the Portland Street directories. This is an advertisement for the cycle manufacturing company, which depicts the building and the mustachioed man bicycling away. And zooming in again on that 1914 map, we can see how the waterfront is changing. Um, shipbuilding continues to be a big piece of the waterfront. We can still see that the Portland Shipbuilding Company is at the Marine Railway um, site. Then we also see off to the right, um, you can see where it says Portland Terminal Company, and then just above that is the Brown Sardine Factory. So here's a postcard image of the Brown Sardine Factory. Um, it was built in 1911. They opened the sardine packing plant on the waterfront at 173 Water uh, Front Street. It was run by the Braun family, not the Brown family. Um, they had operated a similar business in Down East Maine prior to relocating to South Portland. Uh, we know that a second factory opened up a few years later on Portland Street on Spear Wharf. Uh, so here's Spear Wharf in 1896. At the far left was a, a ferry launch. Um, there was a coal shed owned by William Spear and a few other um, storage and warehouse um, outbuildings. And then this is the sardine uh, facility, I mean, canning facility that went into Spear's Wharf. Um, it was it was called uh, it was operated for quite a while as the Seaboard Packing Company. Uh, they also had facilities in Lubeck and Robinston, Robinstown, Maine, and they were later purchased by the Stinson family, and they continued this in operation until the 1960s. Um, the Stinsons had a packing plant that just recently closed just a few years ago, I think up in Goldsboro. So it was a, a the long history of canning um, the Stinson family were associated with, and they had this um, plant here in South Portland. Here's an image. Um, this, we think this is the late 1940s, um, trying to date it from some of the things that were going on in the image. Um, but you can see the waterfront at that period. Um, you can start to see there's some of the fill coming in over to the right of the screen where the shipyards were. 
One of the things that really helped to facilitate development in the neighborhood was the coming of the trolley system. Um, the trolley uh, was electrified into South Portland in 1895, and the trolley uh, system. This is a map of the trolley system um, throughout Greater Portland, and if we zoom in here on this image from a um, marketing uh, poster from the trolley companies, you can see that the trolleys came across the bridge, um, took a right out of Knightville, came down Broadway, went down Sawyer Street, Front Street to Preble Street, and then circled around again, pretty much the same route that the bus line follows today. Here's an image of the trolleys going down. Sawyer Street, and then in the lower right, um, that's that shop front uh, today, the one with the awning. And if you can see on the left-hand side of the sign, um, there was a South Portland Theater that was located on the corner. There's a sign there for it. One of the other reasons why we love to look at maps is it helps us understand why some areas of a neighborhood maybe look a little bit different. And one of the things that we noticed is sometimes where there are no houses, or where there are houses that are built quite later, so they, maybe they're in a 1960s or a 1980s building. And so one of the things that we noticed um, on this section of the neighborhood, which is uh, at the corner of School and High and, and then uh, to Stanford Street, is that there are some newer buildings there. We were looking at the historic maps and we realized that there used to be these large complex of greenhouses um, that were there for growing flowers. Um, that was owned by this gentleman named Niles Nelson who lived in a dwelling um, on School Street. And so his uh, greenhouses would have been at the corner of High and School and also taken up the area that's now a playground. Um, historic images are also great for connecting us, um, making connections between people who lived in the neighborhood and who may have worked in the neighborhood. And so this image of Sawyer Street at the corner of High Street um, the, the building with the awning has a sign coming off of it that says uh, Thorell's Apothecary. And we know that Mr. Thorell lived just a few blocks away on High Street. This is his house at 179 High Street, built in 1882. Um, this is a, a lovely example of the Second Empire style of building. Um, Second Empire style buildings have mansard roofs, which are those uh, slate roofs that are very shallowly pitched and then have another slope that comes down and kind of swoops in with um, gable windows. Uh, this is actually one of our marker program houses. Uh, very early on in our organization's history, Greater Portland Landmarks established a marker program, which we continue today. And we have, I think, um, five or six marker houses in the Ferry Village neighborhood, and this is one of them. Um, so shipbuilding continued to be prominent on the waterfront in um, Ferry Village right through to World War I when the Cumberland Shipbuilding Company uh, was building cargo ships to move uh, U.S. troops. But when we know that really the big impact on the neighborhood was in World War II with the, the construction of the Liberty ships at both the East and West Yards, um, West Shipyards in the neighborhood. Um, so we have some images, of course, like this of all of the work going on. Um, it's hard to see in this image, but just to the left of the crane, I assume that's a crane, um, you can see Fort Gorges out in the harbor here. I would just point out that there's a public forum uh, next week on uh, September 4th for, is it September 4th? Yeah, I think it's September 4th. Um, there's a proposal to um, put a hotel and restaurant out on Fort Gorges, so if you're interested in the future of Fort Gorges, you can <coughs> come over to the East End School in Portland and speak out. Um, oh, you, the really quick and amazing construction that happened um, very quickly in 1940 and 1941 uh, for the shipyards can be chronicled on some of these topo maps. So this is a map that was published in 1941, so it's probably drawn in 1940, and there's no fill at Cushing's Point. And then um, in 1957 is the next time that the, the Geological Service published a map, and you can see the big changes, the dry docks. Um, at this point, the oil and gas um, tanks are, have been installed on the side of the West Yard, um, chronicling the changes that happened here very quickly. Um, we found some great books. Um, Portland Ships are Good Ships was uh, published in 1945 and had some really wonderful aerial imagery of um, the West Yard being constructed, which in the upper uh, image, you can just see a couple of the um, bays under construction. Um, the sardine packing plant is sticking out into the water on the wharf. 
um, and then some addition, another image in the lower right, which still shows some of the housing. Actually, but I picked both of these images because it shows some of the housing that still hasn't been demolished yet. Um, that didn't start till 1941. And you can see those here in this, um, with the east yard in the lower part of the, the image and the west yard at the north um, part of the image. You can still see um, this the residential neighborhood that was between the two shipyards. Again, not OSHA approved scaffolding. I would have died if I'd seen this on one of my project sites as an architect. A uh, little bit blurry images, but I wanted to include them because um, there's been a lot of discussion about the pipeline in South Portland, and I thought some of these were really uh, interesting images of the, the 1941 construction of the Portland pipeline through Ferry Village, so I'll just go through some of these. Coming up, Sawyer Street, where I could identify the street, I tried to pop in a Google Street Map to show. Again, probably OSHA wouldn't have liked this either. <laughs> and here we are a little bit later after the war, um, in this aerial image, you can see the tanks have gone in on the left side of the slide, and you can still see some of the larger um, manufacturing buildings that were still in existence um, closer to the, um, the Portland Pipeline Wharf. The next few slides are kind of before and after images, you know, past and present. Um, I always love to start on a hot, summery day with a picture of smiling children in snow. <laughs> um, and that's a lot of snow on Sawyer Street. <laughs> that's a lot of snow. Um, this is the Dudley residence. That's on Sawyer Street. Um, it was a connected farm building. It's had some additions over time. I'm sure you're all familiar with this building, the Hutchins School. Um, one thing I didn't realize is that initially it had had um, the entrances on the street side of the building, which you can see in the, in the other image. One door for the boys and one door for the girls. This building, uh, which often when you look at a building, you go, mm, most buildings, the windows are sort of arranged so that they line up. And then you look at a building and you go, eh, what were they thinking? What happened? Why'd they do that? And then you look at a historic image and you go, oh, it used to be a storefront. That's why the windows aren't aligned. A former school in Redmond's Hall, now a residence on School Street. This was one when we were out doing our survey work and the interns were like, I don't know what that building is, and I'm like, that had to have been a school. It just had said school. And uh, we love social media. <laughs> well, there's some reasons not to love social media, but one thing I love about social media is um, people who post photos of themselves or it's their childhood and include a picture of them standing on their front doorstep or with pic buildings in the background. It helps us uh, immensely to find these images. And so this is one that we pulled off of Facebook. Um, the interns found, um, they loved little boys, actually. Um, but we could also see that this, um, we're pretty sure that this was the same bungalow that was in the background. So I mentioned that one of the reasons why we did this survey was because we are concerned about uh, the future uh, future landmarks and um, some of these historic neighborhoods and the focus in 2020 for our organization because it's going to be the state's biennial uh, you know we've planned some events that will look back at our community's history over the last 200 years but we're also going to be looking forward to the next 100 years and how we can protect the buildings and places that we love and ensure that future landmarks will be as resilient as those properties that are still with us that are from our state's early history and so um, we're taking some of these projection maps that have been compiled and um, some of the data that we've gathered this summer. Um, this is a map showing um, all of the areas that we surveyed in the Ferry Village neighborhood, the red dots. This has been compiled by the main office of um, GIS and the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. Within each of those dots is all of the climate um, features that we have looked at. So whether something has, uh, where the location of utilities are, basement windows, entrances to buildings, um, all of this information is cataloged here. And so they've overlaid it with their flood projections, the state's flood projections. So it really helps us see which red dots are the ones that have the most or highest risk. And we can go in and look at those that with the highest risk and see what features they may have that elevate their risk. Um, so this is something that we're going to be doing over the next year 
is going in and taking some of the data that we have found this summer and developing recommendations on ways to make your property more resilient, just like we help homeowners if they're trying to uh, replace their windows, make their homes energy efficient, um, anything that you might need to do to your house, um, we want to be able to provide assistance in doing that. And so I'm just going to go through some of the findings that we came up with this summer. So the first one is basement windows. I mean, most of us, we all have basements and those basements have windows. Some of them can be located quite close to grade, like this example up here. Uh, what we found is that about 62% um, of the buildings in the neighborhood do have basement windows and we were able to um, catalog which ones of those are really close to grade and which of those are maybe a little bit higher up and less um, prone to flooding and allowing water or as an entry point into a building. We also looked at site topography and we were pleased to see that only 18 buildings have the street higher than the front entrance to the building. That's, that's really great because you don't, you don't want water running downhill into your front door. I have a neighbor where that happens. <laughs> they put out a little dike around their, their driveway every time it rains. Um, site drainage. This is one that really um, can happen over a period of time and you don't necessarily know it, it's, it's necessarily building up. Um, a lot of us put down, um, we may put down new loam and seed for our lawns or we may put down mulch around the edges of our buildings and that can change the way um, your property drains and it can make um, water that comes off the roof can then flow back towards your basement. Um, and create a potential problem. And that doesn't necessarily need sea, sea level rise to become an issue. Um, we run into that all the time in the historic preservation world. And so about a quarter of the buildings that we surveyed have negative drainage. That means the drainage from their property is running towards their house, not towards the street, and drainage is in the street. Mature trees are both a blessing and a curse. If we're gonna have hotter weather, it's great to have a shade tree. Uh, when a hurricane comes through or, or a heavy nor'easter, it can bring those limbs down and be an impact um, problem on a roof. And again, that doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with climate change either. I mean, that, we know that we can have storms anytime. And so it's good that about almost 120 of the 400 and some odd houses um, have shade trees, um, but also they also have that positive, uh, they also have that negative possible impact. So as I wrap up tonight, I really wanted to take an opportunity to listen to you because I'm sure I know, <laughs> I've talked to some of you over the last couple of days, that there are folks here who've lived in the neighborhood for a long time and we'd love to have your information um, and hear your stories tonight as well. Um, I don't need to be talking all the time. Um, one of the things I don't know that I mentioned is that this um, grant wraps up at the end of September. So I have a window of opportunity to take some of the feedback um, and information from any of you if you've been studying the history of your house or if you have um, some information on the neighborhood that you'd be willing to share with us. We have some cards on the front table. You can give us your name, your address, your phone number, and uh, let me know if you have some information on a building and which building it is that you'd be willing to talk to me about in the next month. Um, I'd love to include that and have that be filed with the report as we finish up the grant. But also, we maintain street piles at our office, and very often we have people come in to research properties, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information on South Portland. Um, you know, the South Portland Historical Society is a great collection of information as well. Um, but we'd like to be able to offer the same types of information to, in our office um, as our realtors or homeowners come in to our, us to do some research. And again, I hope you'll join me in thanking the People's United Methodist Church for hosting us tonight. Thank you very much. Yay. Um, you may not know, but they are a long-standing Fairy Village congregation. Um, they didn't move across Broadway until, I guess, about 1947. Um, they were established in the late 19th century and were located down um, closer to the waterfront in Fairy Village. So I want to thank them and you and all of our sponsors that make our education possible. Thank you all for coming out on a hot, sticky night. I just want to let you know that um, I mentioned that the grant is, I have to wrap up the grant by the end of September. At the end of September, 
Uh, we'll be putting all of the information that we have onto our website, um, uh, links and links to the state database. Um, we also have with us tonight, Portland Media Center is taping this, so if you had neighbors um, who might want to see this, you can um, we'll be able to share this talk with them online. And we also currently, right now, if you go to our website and you go to historic resources, um, it's portlandlandmarks.org um, backslash historic resources, um, you can scroll down to, and there's a, a section on Fairy Village, and if you click on that, it will take you to that link. That's the main GIS and the Historic Preservation Commission link, that, that overlay map of shows which resources. So if you think your house might be in that projected uh, flood zone, you can uh, take a look at what we found out about your house. Okay. So I'm happy to take any questions, or if somebody else wants to talk, um, yes? So to, to look at all of the uh, slides that you put up today, mm -hmm. uh, we would have a link by going to your website. Yeah, it's not up there right now, but it will be up there tomorrow. <laughs> I didn't have time to put it up tonight. And we will also, uh, we'll have a link once um, Portland Media Center puts the video online so that there'll be the voice with the pictures. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Uh, your premise was based on an eight foot rise in sea level. Yes, is that, that's is worst that case. high tide, low tide, mean tide, or what? It's taken, it yeah, it's taken an um, astronomical, if you look at the one, this one is uh, six foot with an astronomical high tide. So we're talking, probably most of us won't be here. <laughs> this is a 50 to 100 year um, scenario. This is, a, this is a, one of the worst case scenarios. But, I mean, even if you look at some of the ones before that, you know, you start to see um, poor flooding, uh, poor drainage even can happen. I mean, that's what we see in Bayside right now, you know, down along the marginal way area. You just don't have good drainage because unfortunately a lot of our outlets were built in the 60s or 70s. And so the water that just comes up to where those drains are and the drains aren't big enough to store all the water that's coming out of the neighborhood, you know, if we have heavy torrential rains. Um, that was another thing that we, that we, that was another data point that um, the city's sustainability office asked us to check was where we noticed ponding, pooling uh, water in the neighborhood. So the poor interns had to go out in the rain sometimes too and <laughs> check to see where um, sections of the neighborhood that weren't draining very well. They were hardy souls. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Then does that get followed up with the city of South Portland at all? Are they made aware of? Yes, so when we start, before we started the project, before the interns arrived, um, we spoke with the sustainability office both here and in Portland, and they actually um, gave us the data points that they wanted us to collect that would be most helpful to them with their information. And so all this information will go to them as well um, so that they can use it in their they're planning that they're doing right now for the One Climate Project. Well, I was just curious about, so that, that ambitious subdivision that never happened, were they Mainers or were they <laughs> evil out-of-state developer? That no, they were not evil out-of-state developers. They were from Maine. I don't know that they were, I haven't been able to find that they were born in Cape Elizabeth, but. They, they were living here. But the panic of 1873 came yep. soon after their plan, so I imagine it fell apart for many reasons. For many reasons, yeah. Financing being one of them. Yeah. And certainly what we see in neighborhoods in Portland that did develop around that time was that they were helped because of the fire. They were trying to find places, but they were developing around places where there was an existing streetcar network, which wasn't here yet. So that hindered them. So even though they had the ferry, they didn't have that other means of transportation across the bridge. 